Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to this special two-part episode covering just some of the highlights from Exploring Different Brains in 2018. In the second part, we are going to hear from some of the dedicated clinicians, specialists, educators, and advocates, and change makers working to improve the lives of those of us with different brains. Ken Dykewald. We have to beef up our scientific creativity and imagination to turn this disease off. If we could do that, if we could somehow create a world without Alzheimer's, we'll be having another discussion when we're 100 years old. And it'll be an interesting discussion. And we're going to remember everything we're talking about today. And we're going to be talking about great grandkids and the contributions we've made to the world. I did a piece for the Harvard Business Review uh, about a decade ago. And I, I'm not that good a writer, but I got lucky and they accepted it. And, and I won the McKinsey Prize that year. And they called me up. They said it was the best article of the year, but you've tied for first place. I said, that's OK. Who did I tie with? And they said, 96-year-old Peter Drucker who is the founder of modern management science. So Mr. Drucker and I had to go to the banquet together. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this guy is 96. He's done more since he was 65 than most of the rest of us will do in a lifetime. If we can imagine a world without Alzheimer's, we're going to see, first of all, intact families, because caregiving can bust up a family and damage relationships. We're going to see people with more financial well-being because dementia and diseases of the aging brain can unravel a family's life savings. We're going to see the ability to have the dream of history, five, six, seven generations alive at the same time, all interacting, all contributing, all making sense of what the future could be. Joseph Lento. You know, many years ago, I actually put um, into uh, a study what was going on with the kids in my program. Now, it wasn't anything new that people hadn't done before, but in terms of the populations of kids I was using, that was different. Um, I was teaching at Lehman High School, and I used probably close to 200 students in a, uh, a study, and they were not only kids with the highest traditional IQs, but also kids with um, emotional and academic um, problems. And I did a side-by-side -side comparison of the students who took instrumental music and those who did not. And the kids who took instrumental music, including the ones that before had lower grades, all of a sudden were now scoring much higher in every academic subject that was taught in the high school, whether it was foreign language, science, math, history, all of them with a minimum of two years of experience in my class now be began having much higher grades. And I'm very, very proud of that because it really shows the power of music across all different brain types. So that, that's something that um, I still use till this day when I'm discussing things with people. And also making music more accessible to our students with special needs. I've recently been, been involved with a company called Loy Music, for which I'm not a paid endorser or anything like that. And they have devised um, a polymer trumpet, which is over here to my right, which is so lightweight that people who have motor difficulties and who lack certain upper body strength, um, they can negotiate this instrument. And so I'm very, very happy to um, begin the process of opening up awareness of the instrument. This is a prototype, and it's not complete yet. Um, now, I've played it, um, and it's, it's got a wonderful sound. And soon, when the finished product is available, I'm going to play it, and I'm going to share it on um, the LinkedIn website. But the cost value of something like this would also be something that our special needs communities can afford. And bringing music to our special needs communities is something I really, really want to do. So any way I can do it, I'm going to, I'm going to do my very best to do that. Seth Keller, what are some of the simple tools that I can use 
that makes sense for me to be doing? Well, it, it's, it's actually a marvelous question because it really has a lot to do with health promotion, promoting our health and, and allowing ourselves to age health in a healthy way. Um, and it, it, it's really everything that we do is starting in the young age to, to as we're getting older to do to, to just that is to be healthy when you're older. And there's no doubt that there's a great growing science hacky on on the uh, brain health and things that absolutely can be done throughout our lifespan to really make ourselves uh, uh, well when we're older in, in our mind. And, and one thing really basically is, is keeping very socially uh, active. There, there's a lot of research that talks about people with interactions and conversations and reading and thinking through and keeping very busy is very good. And that is really working your mind. There's a lot of research, a lot of studies, a lot of information that talked about that, which kind of parlays into uh, the, what people talk about with word games and Sudoku and other kinds of things. So that's kind of really where a lot of that comes from about that working things through. And one example is that what we do naturally in our lives to kind of keep ourselves going is right now, I'll, I'll use an example. You just literally picked up a glass with your right hand automatically and picked it up. So what, what that means is you, and you probably didn't give it much thought And here. I got my glass too. So you basically have a pathway in your mind of what naturally you use right-handed or not pick it up. So that's a pathway that you have formed in your brain. So a way in which we talk to people that I do about people trying to help their pathways in their brain stay healthy is do things differently. So for instance, if you're naturally always using your right hand to pick up your glass, try doing the opposite side. Do it and do that more regularly. That would be the same thing, say, brushing your teeth. If you naturally brush your teeth with one hand, work at the other side. If you're driving a car and you know naturally that you go one direction every time, Next time, maybe try a different way. So what that does, it actually works our brain to learn and use other pathways and it exercises the brain in that fashion. That's number one. Number two is what we, the way we treat our bodies has a big difference. So do we smoke cigarettes? Do we get our blood pressure checked? Do we eat well? Do we not? Are our sugar, diabetes controlled? Everything like that. In, is huge in terms of, of brain health. People that have uncontrolled blood pressure problems absolutely have a much higher rate of cognitive brain dysfunction. People that smoke a lot who have a risk of brain dysfunction because of that, absolutely. People have, end up having strokes, worsening memory problems. There's no doubt that what we put in our bodies have, have an impact. The way we exercise, so if you get your heart rate up on a semi-regular basis throughout your lifespan and not waiting until you're 56 years old, it's not too late, of course, to do that, but trying to do things throughout the lifespan, which is really important for people to realize, why am I doing it now? Why am I putting this effort in now, even though it makes me feel good? You're basically protecting yourself for later, and I guess that might be esoteric, you know, later in life, I'm doing all this work now, 40 years before I get older, 30 years, 20 years. It really makes a difference. You know, for those that are already that age and say, boy, I wish I did this. I wish I did this. But, you know, you'll, you'll learn from that. The key thing, Hacky, is how do you take someone and change their bad habits or I hate to say lazy habits and make them someone that does these things? How do you get someone to go on a, a what we would call a health promotion program? And that's not an easy thing to do, especially in those with developmental disabilities who sometimes need supports. And they need mentors. They need people to look at around them who sometimes may need to support them and be uh, uh, good observers uh, and good role models. And that's something that's very important, too, especially in those that have developmental disabilities that, that you know, go with families or direct supports. Jenny Trocchio. Now, my daughter, Rebecca, is always reminding me that, Dad, sometimes good intentions are not enough. And parents have great intentions, but what is like some of the biggest, what is the biggest mistake that parents make when they're interacting with their children on the spectrum, or their adults for that matter? The biggest mistake. Um, I think possibly the biggest mistake I see is that 
parents are interacting at a different a different level, often a little bit too high, um, and not taking the time to just watch their kids and think about what are they doing and why. Sometimes I like to say, okay, let's just take a minute, back up, <laughs> and instead of coming in with our agenda, and I guess that's really what I see parents doing, they come in with their agenda, and you know, today we're gonna do this and this and this, um, but instead let's take a minute, watch what the child's doing, and think about where's their attention and what is their intention what are they trying to do? And then we can kind of figure out why. And then we can join them in that. Um, but coming in and just kind of directing a lesson is what it feels like sometimes. Instead of just playing, taking time to, to find joy and to have fun and to smile. And that's, I think if every parent would take two hours out of a day, I know that sounds like a lot, but when you see the data about how often we're on our phones and devices, it's kind of small potatoes, but like two hours, that's 15 minute increments, totally manageable. Excuse me as I'm processing this. Um, but two hours to play, to have fun, to interact in a way that's to enjoyable to connect. I think if every family could do that, you would know one another a lot better, relationships would be stronger, and we'd really be able to, to get some momentum going. Kung Do. So the theme to everything I've done over the last 15 years as it relates to autism and the related um, special needs um, community is a grounded in the belief that you have to start with the individual, right? And if you can connect with that individual, you then starts to understand what he or she is good at. So that, and once you understand that, you now are set on a path to explore things that um, hopefully will open up a future, right? But then I think the other aspect of this thing too is once you have identified what these things are, once these individuals are now adults, you have to support them with their needs as well, right? Just because you graduated from high school, it doesn't mean that the need for support disappears. I would argue the need for support actually increases because mom, dad, aids are no longer around as they were before, right? And so how do you continually support this person as an individual rather than as some kind of a group therapy or group support? John Mavros. Now, if what is one piece of advice that you'd give to parents whose child is struggling with some... Uh, behavior in school and other things in school, and they don't know how to help him or her. What is your advice? Okay, start with the child. Show interest and support. Ask the child questions. Try to understand what the child is feeling, what the child is going through. Go to the teacher. First, go to the teacher. After you talk with the child, don't jump to conclusion that it's anybody's fault or anybody is to blame communicate with the teacher. This is something that I advocate school districts, schools, and school principals to get to happen the first month of school, that the teacher reaches out to talk with the parent, to have it's just some casual conversation. Like, how are you doing? I'm, my name is Mr. Mavros. I'm concerned about doing the best I can to help your child learn. And uh, would you just tell me a little bit about uh, what I might be able to do, what, uh, how I might best to work, how this might work, uh, if there's any ways that uh, you would suggest for me to be helpful. This, uh, this can happen in the first week of school and without even talking about what the, um, what the grading system is, what the child has to get to learn. Uh, this is normal protocol in any situation where you have a group of people, and in this case, a student, a parent, and a teacher, that's uh, going to be working together or going to be together, whether they work in or not, they're going to be hopefully joining together for the entire year. I suggest that there be a family orientation month, not just a family night, not just a family uh, 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 open house, not just a p formal PTA, but a whole month in which teachers are encouraged to reach out. And then they try to carry that out for the 
for the rest of every every month to try to re make a contact with every parent once a month. After the, the big holiday that we generally uh, celebrate at the end of December, going into January, it sort of should start over again, not with a whole month of services, but just to be sure that they reconnect. Jim Spore leader. I guess what, one of my biggest learnings and since we talked is that beginning to understand that, that it's a transfer, it's a transformation uh, within who you are as a person. I, I say we don't do trauma-informed, and that's one of the misnomers out there is some schools will get a training and, and they kind of check box and say we're trauma-informed or we've already had that training and always share trauma isn't something we do. It, it is. It's who we are. It's who we become. It's, it becomes our identity. It becomes our culture. It, it's, it's how we take care of our kids. It's how we take, a, take care of each other, our community, our parents. And I've, I've noticed, and, I, and, and, and I'm going to give credit to my Lincoln kids uh, in transforming me. It, to, now it's how I treat the cab driver that, that gets me to the hotel. I want to make sure that I have a positive interaction with that person or the car rental bus that take, takes me to the rental lot. I, I, I want that person to know that I recognize them and that I appreciate them. And so it, it's always looking for positive intent because uh, you, you, never, you never know that sunshine in their day may make the difference. Jackie Rosen. What is one piece of knowledge and advice you'd like to give to our differentbrains.org audience? There's three words that I use, be a, or, or three groups of words, be aware, care, and share. Share the knowledge you learn. Be aware so that you know when somebody is in trouble and care enough to do something about it. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains, Inc. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.org.